direct from the web, it's Billy Masters Live. And now, please welcome your host, Billy Masters. All right, we're coming on the air. Here we are. Hey, everyone. It's me, Billy Masters. Welcome to the show. Another uh, edition of Billy Masters Live. Like a bad, I don't even know, a bad what? There's nothing bad enough to really say. A bad case of herpes. I'm back. Uh, today is Thursday, March 11th, 2021. And it's a, it's, a, it's an interesting day because on March 11th, 2020, I was in surgery. Yes, yes, I was in surgery. I had flown to Boston uh, from Los Angeles. Actually, it's not true. I was in LA. Then I went to Miami to my house in Fort Lauderdale because I wanted to go to the winter party. I know, pandemic or not, try and stop me. And um, then I flew up to Boston, even though we were just hearing things. And on this day, I went into the hospital to have rotator cuff surgery on my left shoulder. I know it looks like I'm pointing to my right shoulder, but this is my left shoulder. And um, that morning, I had to leave for the hospital, I think at 5 in the morning, 5 or 5.30. And they were announcing on television that all non-essential surgeries were being canceled. So I actually didn't know what was going on. And I'm lying there in pre-op, an ironic term for today. And... um. Um, the doctor comes over sniffling and coughing. And all I'm thinking is I'm not going to get out of this hospital alive. And here we are a year later, still in Boston and a beautiful date. It's in the high 60s right now. So anyway, we've got a huge show for you today. We've got, um... Two guests. We actually have three guests. We have our special commentator, uh, NECN's political contributor, Sue O'Connell, is with us. But before we get to Sue, who will be co-hosting with me, I want to talk a second. Everybody has talked about Meghan Markle and Prince Harry sitting down with Oprah. Okay, now, I know you'll. some of you are going to say, you know, uh, I, now I'm a horrible person and we should cancel Billy Masters. But I've got my own show, so like cancel away. I'm still here. I just want to say one thing. I think race plays a part, but let me just say two words to you. Princess Diana. Now, there was very, I, I don't know if there's a whiter woman than Princess Diana. And they didn't like her. They didn't stand up for her. They didn't treat her well. If there's somebody whiter, it might be, Sarah Ferguson. Now, Fergie, if Meghan is complaining that the royal family did not protect her against the media, let me remind you of Fergie being photographed with a man sucking her toes on a yacht. Nobody stood up for her. She was white as can be, so white she was like freckled. So I, I think if Meghan was going in thinking this was going to be a fairy tale, Meghan has a few things to learn. Um, the other thing I want to mention is a, a friend of mine brought this up for me yesterday. Prior to the pandemic, I spend most summers working in Italy. I'm very international. Needless to say, I haven't been to Italy. But when I'm in Italy, I am very often discriminated against. Yes, yes, I have been the victim of discrimination. And no, it's not because I'm gay, and trust me, they can see I'm gay as much as they can see that Megan is partially black. No, the reason I'm discriminated against amongst all Italians is that I'm an American, and you stand out. Now, I don't know. I, I look at Megan, I don't see a strong black woman, but I do see an American, and I see a divorcee, and or yeah, is she a divorcee? I don't know. She's divorced. And I see an actress, although, again, not much of an actress. She was on a show on the USA Network. So, I mean, that's basically like me comparing myself to Oprah. Anyway, the one takeaway I had from that interview, I look, I know that this is going to be so offensive to people, so I, I tell you this in advance. I have never seen chickens run away from somebody coming towards them with a handful of feed. But when those chickens got a look at Oprah coming towards her, they knew what was coming. And she's walking towards them with a carton of eggs. 
and lumber, you know, because chickens can feel tremors in the earth. So they might have thought an earthquake was coming. Anyway, that's it. That's all I'm going to say. I know that I'm going to be in trouble. I don't care. Save your emails. Send them to my first guest. She has been my boss. She has been my colleague. She has been my drinking buddy. We once woke up unconscious underneath a bar in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And um, she's now a mother, a respected journalist. But to me, she'll always be that drunk. <laughs> Sue O'Connell. This is, this is the hill you're going to die on. This is the <laughs> The first one. I'm willing to take it. Right, here I am. Um, here's my daughter with uh, Sarah Ferguson. Oh, wow. Daughter okay. Color, my daughter yep. of color with the royalty, mister. I'm, I'm, oh, I'm being discriminated. Oh, so I, you know, daughter, yeah. Well, you have, now, now, how oh. many years ago did you buy your daughter? Oh, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> no, because I remember you had to get on a plane to go I to did. China. And you had, didn't you have one false call like before well, no, we, you had, almost... we had this is this is a one of these like people who actually gave physical birth this story doesn't really isn't really that great but we my business partner ruby's godfather and uh publisher co-publisher bay windows jeff coakley and i were Signs going my to, China to bring ruby home and mm -hmm. uh it was uh 2001 and there was a um a major thunderstorm that had come across the region, shut down Boston Logan Airport. And our original flight was supposed to be Boston to LA to uh, Guangzhou to Nanchang, right? Okay. So pretty, pretty straight, as straight as you can get. Straight to get forward, control. right. Straight forward. But it shut down and all the flights were canceled for a long period of time. I was freaking out. So we rebooked for the next day and we flew okay. from... Boston to Washington, D.C., got off the plane, flew to Chicago, got off the plane, flew to Los Angeles, got off the plane, then flew to Sydney, Australia, and then flew to Nanchang, and then to, I mean, to Guangzhou, and then Nanchang. So by the you know, time with all the miles you got, you could have bought two kids. <laughs> I'm just saying. All right, go ahead. Anyway, so there, yeah, but that's that's our story. And you've never regretted it. <laughs> Every day. No, no. <laughs> the great thing about parenting, especially in the pandemic, uh, Billy, is that um, you start to wonder, is the pain of parenting equal to the pain I would have had not being a parent? <laughs> and like, have you come up with an answer? <laughs> there but is no at answer. Ernie, at Ernie Bach's house, Ernie Bach Jr. had a party right after The, the car dealer. Trump. He had a party that Fergie came to before oh. all the Epstein stuff hit. So she made the Christmas cards, the holiday no. cards. Oh, well, all right. Now, look, she didn't touch the 12 year old girls. So I don't play. Although she does Although still she live with Andrew, which, you know, but, yeah. Yeah. Do you want to do the disclaimer? Our well, old if disclaimer. Anything Billy says, I have nothing to do with at all. And Nor do I. I really edit his column in Bay Windows, which he doesn't notice, and take all sorts of things out. Oh, yeah. I, I have, I've stopped reading because I'm like, that's not yeah. what I said. Last week was a paragraph. He said he said 5,000 words. We published a paragraph. So that's, no, that's okay. okay. That's fine. It's just the banner at the bottom of that front page. Yes. It's all about baiting and, tea and uh, yes. switching. Some of our major advertisers only read you, so I put you on the cover. Yeah, well, thank God for two of those. Um, so um, it's been a year since we've been doing this. You know, yeah. you uh, you and I have a long history. We've been in print together. We've been on the radio together. We've been on TV together on your defunct, but not not yes. fired, not canceled. Canceled, not fired. The take. The take. Yep. The take. There we are. See, there was an official mug and everything. <laughs> Collector's edition. Um, and so since the pandemic started, yeah. you and I talked and we're like, well, we got to do something. And how is this, you know, this is a year. And that's really staggering to me because on one level, it seems like yesterday and another level, it seems like it's gone on forever. Yeah, no, it, it, it has been, um, you know, for me, I'm not very much of a fan, although I have a great package running on NBC 10 right now and one on NBC and tomorrow, looking back at the year. I'm not a big fan of the looking back uh, generally uh -huh. and in the moment and going forward. And, you know, I don't know about you, Billy, but this, this is pandemic has been so fraught with uh, echoes and ghosts of the HIV AIDS epidemic. I mean, yeah, it's sure. much more condensed in how quickly although 
late, but compared to but quick. how quickly the government's reacted, how quickly it's spread, how quickly we have um, a vaccine, uh, obviously don't have a vaccine for HIV AIDS, but I keep. But I am on prep, and if you're out there and you uh, want to stay safe, um, I am a big advocate of prep. But do your research. The same as I'm telling people with the vaccine. Don't just blindly accept things. Do your research and find. And you have to be comfortable. Just take the vaccine. Don't. I I know. No, I know. But read about it too. Don't be. But I, you know, I feel the loss of death and illness you know there are many people that are going to have chronic illnesses from covid that we don't know to that conversation yet and what i feel is that had we responded correctly by just wearing a gd mask right i mean we it's like some you could say goddamn on billy masters some bad star trek episode where they show up and go gee here we have this magic thing for you you just have to put it on and you can make it out of a napkin right you know, I don't know how many people died that didn't need to, right? I mean, it was right. so. I feel a lot of sadness and grief today about about it. I remember, you know, this time last year, I was still urging people to get a flu shot because flu was killing. Still, did not this year, but twenty thousand to sixty five thousand people a year die from flu shots. People mm. are no, I die of the flu, not of the die from the flu. Uh, you know, there people are asymptomatic and they spread it to people and then go, all right. Well, that's the bigger thing, right? Oh, I never get the flu. I never get the flu yeah, shot, but I am aware. You, you, just know, don't you could be a carrier, right? Yeah, no. you know, so I, I don't, anyway, so I'm grumpy and angry and sad and grief-stricken today, uh, even though it's 70 and, you know, people in my Beautiful house out. are getting vaccinated who need to. I'll be at the end of the list because I'm too pretty, too young, too healthy. I mean, it's just the story of my life, Billy. You know, I, I know. You know, and multi-orgasmic. I don't know if that applies to you, but, you know, I'm just putting it out there. But we're still here. You know, Massachusetts, we still can't figure out this how to roll out. I mean, the, the Anything. Vaccination, um, you know, website. I mean, it's just and we need we need a mess. When we get to the other side of this, we need to invest in public health. We need to invest in, in vaccine um, rollouts, how to like places like is it. um West Virginia, I think, has one of the higher vaccination rates because they've done such a, they've been investing in getting people vaccinated for 10, 15 years. So, and we need healthcare for people. People need to be able to have healthcare. And finally, this package got signed today by Joe Biden with no Republicans supporting it, even though they supported it in December when there was a different president. Uh, And, um, you know, finally help will be on the way. We still haven't prioritized. uh, Better people. Teachers, (laughs) Teachers, <laughs> teachers over restaurants. I mean, so one of my out. I mean, one of my best friends, um, you know, I, as people know, I've been quarantining at my parents in a Boston oh. suburb. Oh, hi, baby. Come on. Oh, my God, I love it. Um, mm-hmm. Anyway, oh, so beautiful. <laughs> anyway, I- um. I've been uh, quarantining in a Boston suburb with my parents and where I grew up. So I have friends that um, I grew up with who, you know, because once you're born in a suburb, you'll die in that suburb. (laughs) And some people are still here. One of my best friends is a teacher, first grade teacher. And she is she just qualified for her vaccine. She can get it this Saturday. Her 95 year old aunt just got it last week because they couldn't find anything. And I'm like, if there's nothing for a 95 year old woman then what hope is there for me <laughs> i know there's a there's a correlation there, so. <laughs> there is yeah um but so when do you qualify you're going to be probably like middle of april right probably i mean when they open it up to everyone i'll qualify so it, i think midnight tonight massachusetts is and it's not like we don't know how to do this like we know how to buy yeah. Taylor Swift tickets we know how to buy billy eilish tickets we know how to get super bowl tickets at midnight they're opening up a pre-registration for everyone to register in advance. And when you're you're eligible, you'll be notified. But again, they're not staggering when yeah. you can, like if you're, you know, you're born in January, you can, you know, do it this day. So the site will probably crash again. I mean, I just- Right, well, and that's been the problem when my parents signed up for it. The day that they were allowed to, it was the constant refresh, refresh. Right. But you have to be village, uh, vigilant. And yeah. I should say that we're talking about Massachusetts. Right. All around the country, you're all having different situations. Different so please right. look into your local state um, uh, guidelines because yeah. unfortunately, they're all you've got. 
And the other thing, you know, you said when we come out of this, we have to do this, this. You also have to look at the people that you elect into office and see that they are people who are going to be accountable to their constituents because they work for you. And yeah, if they're I, not helping you, then what good are they? One of the, I think the differences between Europe and America uh, and, and how and some of the Asian countries and the way that they responded um, to the virus, the way the people respond is that they think the government works for them in Europe. Right. Yeah. They don't fear the government. They think that the government is a store clerk that's supposed to provide a service for them and they demand it. In America, we act like, oh, no, too much government. We don't want anyone giving us a vaccine or giving us health care right. with our tax money, by the way, which we're paying for. So I think it would be great if we could change our point of view and know that the government works for us. Like mm -hmm. it's a service that works for us and demand that be, that be a better service. Absolutely. And I think what we saw happening at the Capitol with the riots, we have seen that in other countries over the years. And I'm not giving them a credence, but, you know, if you don't like your government, you overthrow your government, you vote them out, you do it peacefully. Well, we but do it. well did you see the stat that a lot of those idiots, terrorists hadn't voted? Like they yes, had I did see that. Election, right. So we have the means to do the things that you want, whatever your political point of view is, whatever party and you do want. it through the system. Go vote. It's easy enough. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Oh, well, there you go. That's that. Yeah. So I have to go to our show. So um, okay. I know uh, our first, you know, can I just say we have very, you and I have talked about this, but very rarely is this show ripped from the headlines. <laughs> but I just wrote about this story like, three weeks ago mm -hmm. and I said you know I wonder if I could if I could actually be a journalist again <laughs> and and uh and follow through with the story and both of our stories today come right out of the headlines um since 2008 Tyler Rex was a superstar in the world of professional wrestling in 2002 he got married to his wife Priscilla and in 2011 the couple had a daughter Mia but last year I mean excuse me last year last month Tyler yeah. Tyler came out publicly as a trans woman. Since then, she's been using her notoriety as a platform to speak out for the rights of transgender people, actually, of all people. And uh, we are thrilled to welcome, direct from the headlines, Gabby <laughs> Tuft. Hey, Gabby. Hi, how are you? Oh, good. We have we have audio. <laughs> I know. I'm sorry about that earlier. <laughs> No, that, you know, again, I, you know, I love seeing today on The View, they lost Wesley Snipes <laughs> twice. So, oh, I mean, no. we're all in the same boat. Yeah. Okay, so, um, <laughs> you know, Gabby, I, I find your story so, I'm not, I, you know, uh, full disclosure, I am not a wrestling aficionado, although I know people who are. And I had heard your name and I had seen the pictures. First, let me just ask you, because sometimes it is a problem. When you see pictures like this, is that painful to you to see yourself as Tyler or are you okay with that? No, actually, I am totally okay with that. I fully embrace my time as a male on this planet. I loved it. I did a lot of really fun things. I accomplished some really amazing things physically. I mean, I was yeah. in the WWE. That was that was a blast. <laughs> <laughs> um, I started my fitness company, Body Spartan, which is funny because that company is 90% male demographic. So, wow. Uh, Transitioning to female was kind of a shocker. There was a lot of sticker shock, but most of our customers and fan base stuck around. So um, to answer your question, no, I, I don't feel any pain. We have all of our pictures of me as a boy around the house with my family, with Priscilla and with Mia. And every time I look at them, I'm happy. I, I love that part of my life. I don't regret it. I um, There was just so much love during those times. So I can't be, um, I can't be bitter for any reason. And I know that's a big thing too. Like a lot of people that are transitioning really have a hard time looking at those photos. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I hear that. And I hear using the name also can be difficult for them. Yeah, the dead name is what that's called. And right. for some people it is really difficult. I am trying to take a much different approach. Uh, actually, Priscilla, my wife, created this little phrase. She said, you're not the only one transitioning. The rest of the world is transitioning too. So 
Yeah. So when somebody, either in journalism, PR, or even a friend of mine that I've known for you know most of my life, they call me Gabe or bro or dude, I, I understand that it's going to take some time. So I can't be mad at that. It's a slow process. Even my mom is here. She is visiting. Oh, oh wow. California. Yeah. She came out. Uh, Priscilla went on a spiritual retreat. Retreat. <laughs> retreat. <for yesterday. laughs> left <laughs> well i say that because i was just tweeting out your live stream right before so. oh okay good yeah, um but my mom is here and she's visiting and she still calls me gabriel sometimes because that's my given name and she doesn't mean to she's like oh sorry or she'll say you know oh this is my son oh i mean my daughter but it's yeah. just natural you know 42 years and i'm her firstborn so there's she's trying she's really trying and she's okay. a wonderful mom so you know billy and i used to Billy and I used to work on a radio show together called One in Ten here in um, Boston, and it was an LGBTQ focused talk show on uh, mm -hmm. FNX. And okay. you know, a lot of times kids would call in and talk about coming out to their parents and how their parents would have such a hard time, even if they had seemed to be um, LGBTQ supportive, you know, whatever the era was that we were in. But um, you know, right. as supportive as they could be, and we would explain to them. You know that the, there's a there's a, a grieving process for parents to some degree when their child, regardless of whether it's they were expected to go in the family business or they were expected to have a wedding to a man or they were going to marry in their faith or they weren't right. going to move away from home or you know any of this expectation that parents put on uh, and, and projection they put on their their children that there's a grieving process when that changes and it doesn't meet their expectation. It doesn't always mean that they're not supportive or they don't love you or they won't catch up. It just means you sometimes, you know, as, as, as Priscilla has said, you need to give everybody the space to come along because you've had your whole lifetime right, to get used to this, to, to think about what's going on and to deal with it. And, and, and now it's like, everybody hurry up. Right. Right. Yeah. And especially with like parents of younger children and adolescents, I one thing that I would love to see change and I'm I'm not the end all. I'm just one person going through a transition and it's very new to me, but I've been kind of hanging out in some support groups and observing online and actually attended um, an LGBTQ support group here in Austin. The president of the uh, LGBTQ center, Anna Nguyen, invited me to it and I just watched and observed. And one of the things I noticed was exactly what you said, Sue. There are parents that are not quite sure how to handle the transition. They're, they want to be very sensitive, but their children have this, um, they have that issue with the dead name or the photos. Mm -hmm. So, and like I said, my situation isn't everybody's, but I think it'd be amazing if we could create an awareness that this is not something that is awkward or strange or abnormal. And going through a gender transition can be viewed as something beautiful and amazing and a metamorphosis. And if your child comes to you and says, mom, dad, I'm transgender and I'm in the wrong gender, at that point, wouldn't that be amazing if the parents, maybe the next generation, maybe another generation after that, whatever it takes, they could just say, oh my gosh, I'm so happy for you. Let yeah. me help you. And mm -hmm. there is no grieving process. There is no emotional disconnect where everybody needs to take a time out and go figure it out. And I trust me, I understand that yeah, is necessary right. now. But looking forward, how amazing would that be? What a wonderful mm -hmm. world that could be. It's also interesting for you and I, and also, uh, you know, I think about others like Jazz Bono and, and Caitlyn Jenner. You have a brand. Right, you've you've spent a lot of your life building a brand uh, that is related, you know, around your name, around your identity, around your visual image, um, you know. So from a business standpoint, uh, it also is a, a little bit uh, tricky in the sense of you want to make sure that you know you get credit for that accomplishment, that brand building. Uh, that all of that, I don't mean to dehumanize you, but you know, no. you, it, we're in the celebrity business and, and, and the, the athletic business. Yeah, yeah you know? absolutely. I mean, I, I love and I care about every one of my customers and my followers with Body Spartan. They are amazing. Uh, and it's, yes, I mean, I, I've spent, gosh, it was 2013. My, my brother committed suicide in 2013, which is why I built the company. He became addicted to methamphetamines and we had no idea the seriousness of the drug. I knew nothing about it. Um, and here's just a quick background on that. And it's a little 
it's a little off topic, but it'll get there. And you'll, I think you'll understand why. <laughs> Quick anecdote. Uh, he called me one time. He was high on meth. And he had disclosed to us that he was using, but we had just kind of had our go rounds with the family. And he asked me to fly down from uh, San Francisco area to South Orange County in California. And I told him, no, I'm not coming down. You need to get sober and then we'll talk. And that was the last time I got to talk to him. And so yeah. I missed, I feel like I missed an opportunity to help him and possibly save his life. And the day after Christmas, he drove to a shooting range. He was supposed to come home. My dad was going to put him in rehab, but he drove to a shooting range where he went often and he pulled the trigger. And so I never saw him again. And I swore to myself, I would never miss an opportunity to help someone. And that is how Body Spartan started. I, the only thing I was good at at that time was fitness. So I wrote a program and I got it out there and I started creating motivational videos and I reached Gosh, some of our videos have like 20 million views. Wow. And we have had amazing success stories of not people just transforming their physique, but lives being saved. People in the middle of uh, committing suicide have come across our videos. Uh, one, one guy that is just a, such a good friend of mine now, he watched his mom die on life support and it messed him up so bad that he couldn't go on. He had a, he had a family. Um, he took all his blood pressure pills one night and he was scrolling through Facebook, came across one of our motivational videos found the will to live, threw up all the pills, and then totally started his life over. It was amazing. Wow. So that, that, and then, you know, so you talk about the brand. Mm -hmm. I'm not so much concerned with the brand and, and getting credit for it. What I really want to do is help save lives and change lives. And mm -hmm. so moving from Body Spartan, which will still keep running, into what's happening with me and my transition, I really want to look towards gender equality and creating awareness. And hopefully in doing that and using the brand that I've built in my name and my platform, we can create more awareness and we can save lives. Like we, we can change the world in a very short period of time. I, at least I believe so. That, that's great. That's the exact opposite of what Billy does too. So that's- Thank you. Idea. Yes, exactly. I just make people laugh <laughs> while they pull the trigger. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, but that, you know, I, I'm really curious because we've had lots of discussions with transgender people, activists, particularly activists, and also people who have who really don't understand. And so, while I I um I know a lot about it, I'm curious. In your case, when did you come to even believe peripherally that you may have been born in the wrong body? Oh gosh. Um... Well, so it's a little different for me than some people, again, because mm -hmm. it's such a late transition in life. I have memories as early as four years old of wow. stuffing toys up my shirt, trying to pretend like I'm pregnant, which I don't think is very uncommon for children to kind of like, oh, maybe, maybe this is what we do. Maybe this is what we don't do. But as I got to be a teen, I would sneak into my mom's closet and try on her clothes when nobody was home. And it felt right. And that was wow. when I kind of started questioning like, oh, is there a way to change? No, I can't. So being transgender wasn't a thing when I was a kid. At least it wasn't, right. wasn't mainstream. So as you know, a 10 to 13 year old, I had no access to that information. So I just kind of thought it was like, what's the word, deviant, I guess. And so I hit it and I, I kept hiding it all my life. The older I got, the more I kind of pushed away from that by bodybuilding. <laughs> I got into a lot of steroids. Mm -hmm. I've yeah, the complete that. opposite. Yeah, I went as far away as possible because I thought that's what, you know, that's what I was supposed to do. And I just kept thinking, sure. this thing where I like girls' clothes, that's just dumb. It's deviant. I got to stay away from that. So it was only about three years ago when I really kind of disclosed this to Priscilla. And it, you know, it, it happens in the privacy of the home. And I kind of. I would hope. Me, yeah. <laughs> it wasn't a crazy like Hollywood streaking moment or anything like that. Right. It was, just, it was in the home where I was like, hey, can I try on something of yours? And she's so open to just making sure that I'm okay. And we have a wonderful relationship. It's very understanding. And so that's when it kind of started. And it started, you know, in in the privacy of her home. And then it was when COVID hit and we all got locked down. Mm. That's when I started presenting female on a nightly basis after Mia, my daughter, would go to sleep. So mm -hmm. I would try on clothes and Priscilla would help me do hair and makeup, which she's an amazing teacher, by the way. <laughs> well, she's watch. also, I should show the photo because she's also oh, stunningly beautiful. I mean, you've got a good looking wife. I really do. Like I have the best guru ever. <laughs> 
Yeah, and you also partner. make a really cute couple, both <laughs> pre and post. You really look great. Oh, together. thank you so much. I really appreciate that. <laughs> Most of it's well, I've I seen her. Part. I've <laughs> I've seen her, you, the two of you interviewed, but what I, what I'm curious about is because we haven't had this on this show before. How do you present this to your daughter who is there pre and post? And what's that journey been like for her? How old is oh, Mia? Mia is nine. She turned nine in November. Okay. So uh, that is a great question. And it's one that a lot of people have asked, how is Mia handling this? You know, what, it, what does this do to a child? And I was really, everything aligned perfectly for my transition. She is into this, uh, this iPad game where kids can create like template characters. And it's called, I think it's called Gotcha Life, but her and her friends play it and they just create all these cute little characters. They dress them up. One of the options in that is what's called a gender bend. Total coincidence, nothing to do that I introduce her to, but you can take your little character, hit the gender bend button, and it makes it either the opposite, like boy, girl, vice versa. And so she would come down like, Dad, look at my gender bend. I'm like, oh, that's so cool. So one night I had a lot of courage. I had told um, I had told my best friends, these, these are, this is crazy. This is actually the first night I started disclosing things to my friends told my best friends, I told my neighbors. So I had all this courage and I said, you know what? I need to tell Mia, this, it's time. So I went upstairs, she was in bed reading and I said, hey Mia, daddy needs to talk to you. I said, okay, what's going on? And I explained to her, I said, you know, you've got this game you play where there's a gender bend. And she said, oh yeah, I love that. And I said, well, I know you've noticed that my nails are painted. Cause that was one thing I did. I painted my toenails and I painted my fingernails. That was kind of my first like way to ease her into it. And sure said, I'm kind of going through a gender bend myself. And she goes, oh, that's so exciting. I said, yeah, it's mm. very exciting. And I told her, I said, but Mia, I'm not going to be doing it outside the house. I want to make sure that everybody's comfortable. She goes, well, why won't you go outside, daddy? And I said, well, I'm honestly, I'm afraid that people might make fun of me. And my daughter leans over, gives me the biggest hug, and she says, daddy, I will never make fun of you. I love you. And like, I just started bawling. <laughs> like yeah, the waterworks just came and she squeezed me so tight. And of course, you know, after that, she's had her moments where she's had questions that she wants to ask mommy instead of daddy because she doesn't want to hurt my feelings. So they have a good talk, but she is so supportive. She's, I think her biggest fear, and I, I try not to talk about Mia a lot because she's asked us to kind of keep things of private. But I think this is a really good opportunity for people to understand since we're talking about gender equality and I'm trying to show the world that we are a fairly normal family. I've, I've got a mm -hmm. wife and a daughter. The, the friends come over to play. The neighbor kids all come over. They know me. They've seen me presenting full female. They've seen me without hair and makeup. But Does one, Mia still call you daddy? She does, yeah. And I told her, I said, yeah, and this is kind of what I'm leading into because one of her friends said, you're losing your dad. And she was really hurt by that. She came to me crying and she said, this person said, I'm losing my dad. And I looked at her and I said, Mia, let me ask you a question. Or let me ask you a couple of questions. I said, since I've started my transition, has anything that we've done changed? She looked at me, she's like, well, what do you mean? And I said, does the way I talk to you change? She goes, no. I said, do we still play board games? Yeah. Do we still skateboard? Yeah. Do we still ride the motorcycle? Do you still get on the back? Yeah. Do we still play with our friends? Mm -hmm. Do I treat you any differently? And she goes, no. And I said, sweetheart, I will always be your daddy. No matter what the outside looks like, I'm your father. I will always be your daddy. And you can call me daddy, mommy, whatever you want, but call me daddy for as long as you want. And I am your father. And she just wrapped up in love and it's been that way ever since. So it, it's, you know, it's so great that you're able to have this communication because so many people, they fumble with the answers. And so they keep it from kids because they don't have the answers. But I think, you know, I think there is strength in not knowing the answers and admitting that because it gives the kid the opportunity to say, I don't have the answers or I have questions and you're just yeah. like me. So right. and what happened, the secrets, the secrets part is what the, is what the, the poison part is, is the secret yeah. part, right? Yeah. And then, for anybody, for any, anything, if you can, and that doesn't mean you have to tell everybody, right? I mean, that's the there's right. a difference personal and there's a difference between secret. There's, you know, what we keep in the family and 
secrets and secrets are not good, right? But no, no, personal, space, no. personal spaces and, and, and having a space where you can talk, where a child feels that they are able to ask without being judged. And I love that she doesn't want to hurt your feelings because my kid's been hurting my feelings uh, every day. Ever since you did. <laughs> and I feel like a great parent because I allow it to happen. But uh. <laughs> And I'll tell you that basically the fact that I'm doing a show kills my mother because now there's no secret. So, oh, you yeah. know, I don't think you have to be, you know, I don't think that you have to be transgender or gay or anything to have no. these issues of how open are you outside of the house? And I think that's a big issue. And a lot of kids, we, when Sue and I did one in 10 together, we had a lot of questioning. Which plays it with calls. Keith Orr so that Keith Orr doesn't send us oh, a Oh, he's email not watching. Saying that he was the co-host <laughs> and Billy was the guest co-host. And oh, Mary God. Breslauer yeah. and Michael <laughs> Smith. And they were all dead. Anyway, <laughs> the point was, was that people called us up and they just had secrets that they had nobody to talk to yeah. about. And okay. it wasn't always about gay, straight, transgender. It was just feeling isolated. And the fact that you have this dialogue with your daughter is, I think, beautiful for both of you. I think you're both going to get a lot out of that. Thank and your you. wife. Yeah, that's a big thing, too. I think there's so much going on with social media where people feel like they have to uphold an image. Yeah. And that we're all trying to keep up with uh, the people that have millions of followers and it's the old fake it till you make it. And so that makes people feel like they can't be genuine and they don't have people to talk to, like you were saying, Billy. And I think what I found through my, well, actually, I know what I found through my transition is that when I stopped caring about what other people thought, that's when I became limitless. And that's when right. I really was able to bring my energy from when I was confident as a male, like when I was, when I was Gabe, let's just use my dead name for a second. I'm not afraid to, when I was Gabe, I was confident. I knew exactly how everybody would, whatever look I got when I would walk out, I was giant, 280 pounds. I had those giant dreadlocks. I looked like Ragnar in the mountain combined. So yeah. it's like, I knew how to respond to everybody, whether it's in love or anger or whatever, however I would, would respond, hopefully it was always in love. Um, I had my moments. <laughs> but I would, you know, and as a so much at my wrestling friends before this interview, Gabby. So, you know, <laughs> A little tremor before I join. So uh -oh. you know, but, but now that you're, you know, it's funny that you mentioned Gabriel. Do you think that it was easier for you because you had already put on a persona of Tyler when you were a professional wrestler? So being somebody else, did that make it easier? Or did that make it harder for you to be authentic? I Wait, do you mean when uh, when I started my transition and becoming? Well, I'm think I'm just yeah. saying that you know because you had already made one change from Gabriel to Tyler, the big wrestler. Then right. when you transitioned to Gabby, did you look at it as another transition, or did you feel that you were stripping away all the transitions and being yourself? Oh, that is a really good question. Uh, so wow, I, I think you're going to pull that one out, Billy. Oh, no, sure. you know. I love that. <laughs> Ask all the good questions, Billy. <laughs> so when I was uh, when I was in WWE, Tyler's just a character. And mm. the best character, according to Triple H, which he was a great help to me, and a lot of the veterans always say, is just you with the volume turned up. And so that's what Tyler was. Tyler was a big, mean guy that, you know, kicked butt in the ring. Um, but Gabe was really a big teddy bear. So oh, see? <laughs> I was big and tough and I could take care of business if I needed to, but you know, inside I was always a big softy and I had a big heart for everybody. So it's really important to just note that when the switch went on for the ring and for Tyler Rex, that was not Gabe. That was a persona. Mm. And whereas me right now in my transition, Gabe and Gabby were the same person. It's just a oh, different. Oh, that's interesting. I really want to make sure that people know that this isn't a show. This isn't like a character or persona. This is all coming from the soul. It's coming from the heart, and it's a reflection of who I really am inside. And he was trapped inside for many, many years. Wow. And Bill, you should know. You probably don't know this, but I, I and, and and you know, professional wrestlers are like everyone else in terms of personalities and good people and bad people and cranky people. But I have never met a professional. I've never met a professional wrestler who was not a really nice and polite person. 
I mean, yeah. I, I once got on an airplane with, you know, flying somewhere and it was filled with wrestlers going to the, I don't, this is in the 80s or 90s, who knows? Uh, are the so, like, so nice to their spouses and it's, you know, what you see is not necessarily what you're going to get. I know some of them are real idiots, but um, <laughs> my experience is that they have been very nice, polite people. Yeah, so what it, what you're really telling me, and I think it's so interesting, is had Tyler not been in the equation, the transition from Gabriel to Gabe was really pretty seamless for you. From Gabriel to Gabby, you mean? To Gabby, excuse me, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah it, it was very We're nice. Gabby. Well, it's going to be a long road, Billy <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so but basically, so people who are fans of Tyler, they were seeing there an act, and yeah. you are really being closer to who you always were all along. So I think that's yeah. so it's, you know, If you were to ask around backstage, I was kind of a quiet person. Like I didn't wow. really rub my feathers. I was just quiet. I was. I try to be as nice as possible to everybody. So the person, like I said, in the ring is just an actor. It's a character. So and Gabby, me now is just Gabe with a female persona. That's it. Or you know, female. We, we've, well, it. yeah. Well, we've talked, you know, we, we had uh, a guest on here previously. We talked about transgender people, athlete, athletes, uh, participating in competitive sports. And, you know, this is something that, uh, there's a case right now, Sue Weir. There's a lot case. of, I mean, there's a lot. There's a big on. one state, that they're talking this, about. And, yeah, but it's and, also the state-by-state state issue, which yeah. is one that's the most concerning. This is sort of in the same way that slavery uh, was expanded to uh, states as they became state state. Union, as the same way that the Defense of Marriage Act was both federally, but before that it was state by state. We're seeing a lot of state uh, legislatures trying to move forward on the uh, banning of trans athletes. Uh, uh, from competitive from competing in high school. In, I mean, in high school for crying, it's just, it's just disgusting. Well, and I will take somewhat of an opposing viewpoint because we had one guest here who explained to me, which I was pretty ignorant about this, that the male musculoskeletal is it has advantages that females wouldn't have, and this one transitioned from female to male much later in life. And he now said to me that if he had tried to compete when if he had transitioned when he was in high school he could never have competed with other boys who were born male and grew up male so it's it seems to me that it's not fair to anybody but that being said where do you stand on this oh that is good you gosh you got the good questions i'm happy to answer this too so i was okay. asked this too long ago by several of my friends because they were just saying this is a this is a huge issue and some of them were mad some of them took you know either side and we're going to see that throughout the states it's a right. very difficult standpoint and billy you're absolutely right so for both men and women there are muscular differences there's bone structure differences post puberty for anybody that's pre-puberty that's transitioned i think there should never ever be any type of discrimination i mean there should never be discrimination period um, I think they should absolutely be allowed to compete in competitive sports. But for post-puberty, I don't currently have the answer to that. I yeah. am, I mean, and this is me transitioning and this is me, I'm a professional athlete, uh, you know, ex-pro wrestler. I currently road race motorcycles. So they're really fast crop rockets. I race those, um, <laughs> they have a female division. Um, and me personally, I'm not gonna race the female division because I prefer like the open class, <laughs> if I'm if I'm gonna is go there, for it. So I'll there is an open class, class. <laughs> an intramural class. Yeah, I, and so here, here's the thing. It's like, there are, I've seen some things, I, I watched a Joe Rogan podcast where they talked about one of the MMA fighters that's transgender. I saw that, yep. There was there was some serious medical um, or, or, or dangers physically that, that were occurring. But for me to take a stance and to say, um, yes or no at this point, that is really difficult. I think yeah. that I need to kind of sit back and watch things unfold. I am 100% for my transgender brothers, sisters, my LGBTQ community, and I wanna see equality for everybody. I wanna see sports happen. I wanna see transgender men and women compete fairly in sports. That there's and just- safely. Safely, yeah. And I think if we can come up with, with 
those guidelines, I think it'll happen. I really do. I, I don't like the fact that the bills are passing and that everything's being banned right now. I don't think it's time for that. I think we need to take a better look and a closer look at everything before anything like that goes through legislation. And Bill, yeah, I think, yeah, go ahead, too. He's speaking as well, too, right? As a former uh, middle school soccer coach, oh. uh, I would say that 99.9% .9 of the middle school and high school athletes are not going to be professional athletes. <laughs> Well, right. that's, that's really like, they're not going to get scholarships. They're not. I mean, that, that you know, the, the argument on the high school level and the middle school level is just so ridiculous in many ways because we act like, you know, it should be fun. It should be it should not be right. hard. It should be sport for, for physical fitness and social activity and engagement and all those things. Right. Which is a right. whole trying to change society. So. You know, the argument on that level is just ridiculous, especially if you've ever coached an actual low, pro, poor performing sport in high school. <laughs> you know, you know. And, and, and the second part is, you know, we, we need to, to look at a way to expand society so that like people are competing against like people. Like if you look at marathons, like the Boston Marathon, the elite women who run in the marathon are beating you know, 95% of the men who are running in the marathon, right? So right. there are sports, you know, probably motocross and other sports where genders can compete against each other and the elite athletes are, are somewhat, uh, their gender is not necessarily a factor in that. Right. And you could look at ways maybe to have people who are, are equal in, in abilities and status to compete against each other instead of breaking us into genders. We're not there yet. I love that, I love that idea. Like, yeah, I, physical abilities. I mean, that is amazing. That like, is yeah, well, and, and I only take Billy right now, right? No, and, that, well, that's, I was just going to say, no. as a boy who participated in some sports no. in high school, I would have still been beaten on the girls' team. I can take but, that. What? And then, you know, and then there's the whole girls thing, girls team as an insult, right? Sports writers do this all the time. When oh yeah, right. Well, that's true. someone they say, oh, the girls tennis team, or oh, the girls soccer team, as if just being right. on the girls team is the worst possible place to be. So right, it's an insult. And I, but I'm going to say, you know, the uh, one thing is, is that I think. And, and I don't know, because I'm certainly no expert, but it's never stopped me from giving an opinion, um, is that I believe that particularly in high school, I think sports are split up in male and female to give a alleged level playing field no, but to the girls. No, there isn't, right? So that's the title. Nine. Yeah, well, we realize that, you know, right. When I was in the 70s, God knows what would have happened if I didn't have to practice, you know, at, at the gym after <laughs> the boys practice, right? Or the boys get all the money or the football teams get all the money and the women's sports don't get any of the money right We're well that's so true. For many equity when it comes to women in sports period right. and i you know and interestingly most of the women's sports and women in sports are are saying you know let's go forward and figure out a way to make the trans athlete inclusion happen when we're right. the ones still not making the same amount of money as the the male soccer players right i uh i just in preparing for this <laughs> it, yeah. not me. but but yeah well, or me, for that matter. Um, I, in preparing for this, I went back and was reading about Renee Richards, who, of course, was a pioneer in this field and who was very vehement about wanting to compete against women once he transitioned to a trans woman. And at, uh, at once he retired, she retired. On reflection, there was a quote that said, now that my professional career is over... I'm not sure I made the right decision and that because of where I was as a male athlete when I became a female athlete, I did have an unfair advantage. So I think that you're right. There has to be a case-by-case -case basis and perhaps sports should be intramural in high school and junior high. I don't know. I don't see this changing in like professional sports or the Olympics, but I don't know. But we also have the challenge of this. There's not always a binary, you know, I, I don't have it in front of me, but you know, the athlete from, um, uh, I forget where she was from, uh, had a high testosterone level, uh, but it's, is biologically female and competes female, but was excluded right. because she just as genetically had a higher testosterone level. And that's, that's a very, yeah, you know, but, but she's not transgender. 
She's right. female, identifies as female. Her she sex. may have been intersex, though. We don't no, no, you know. There's so many things. No, no. I mean, it's it, and that, that's another conversation. But her, right. her, her family genetically, and I think um, uh, her community tends to have a higher testosterone level. So do we right. say to her because you were born that way, you don't right. compete with other women? For, you know, from the Olymp and you know, putting the Olympics in charge wow. of. Judging things is always just a disaster. Well, I think this is beyond all of our, our pay scale. But, Gabby, what I'm curious about is if you wanted to compete now as a wrestler, what would you do? Oh. <laughs> you mean in the women's or the men's division? Well, well, what would, you know, first, I guess, what would you want to do and what would you be allowed to do? Oh, well, I mean, I don't want to spoil the magic of nope. wrestling show <laughs> we, we i don't want to spoil i don't and i also don't want to spoil the magic but there are some of the women that there could be some genetic testing on and maybe I mean, find yeah, out what's true. going on i mean it's it's sports entertainment i mean vince is not right. um you know I, i'll use vince as the example because vince mcmahon is the biggest name in, in wrestling and he's been around forever wwe it, it, you know it's well known that that wwe is sports entertainment so it's right. very athletic it was by far the hardest sport I'd ever done. And I've done a lot of sports. I wrestled in high school. I was an avid snowboarder. I surfed for many, many years. Right? Like, oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, I did a lot of like very extreme sports. And wrestling was the hardest. It was absolutely the hardest because you have to take all the athleticism that you have and you have to work with the person in the ring. You have to know that person very well and trust them. And then there's a psychology to it. You have to be able to adjust what you're doing on the fly, depending on how the crowd responds. So it's very, very, <laughs> it's the hardest thing I've ever done, but it was the most rewarding. And as far as like what I can and can't do, if you've watched wrestling, there's a huge integration right now that's happening between men and women. They'll do mixed mm. tags. They'll bring in the women and the men all the time together. So if I were to go back, I don't have a problem being in the women's division. I mean, everything I do, I want to be considered 100% female. I mean, I recognize genetically with chromosomes, I, you know, there are people that will never consider me female, which is okay. Mm -hmm. But for me, I want to do everything as female as possible. So if I go back, if let's say hypothetically, you know, I don't have any plans. <laughs> There's been zero time. God, I thought we were going to have an announcement, a scoop. <laughs> <laughs> if I were to go to or even AEW or any of the any of the wrestling associations, I would want to be presented 100% as female. And I wouldn't feel bad about it because it's entertainment. It's not putting me in like a powerlifting competition with other females where I wouldn't right. feel like, you know what, maybe I shouldn't do this right now. I don't know how I, I don't know how I feel about that since I, that, that was what I did for so many years. And I have so much muscle mass. It's just, I think something like that for me, I would choose not to, but wrestling, Hey, I would I would go full female division for sure. <laughs> Gabby, just promise me that if you decide to go back, you'll tell us first. Oh, sure. You want the, okay, got it. You I want give the me scoop. Another. Yeah. I'll, I'll give, give you my to, <laughs> Gabby, you are a delight. And can I just say you've answered a, you've really, you know, it's funny, the way that you present yourself puts others at ease and makes it comfortable, A, to ask the questions and B to make the mistakes that we're all going to make. Um, I think that you're a great ambassador for our community. And thank um I, I thank you so much for being on our show. Absolutely. It was my pleasure. Thank you both for having me. I'm so grateful. Great Thanks, Gabby. We'll have you back. Bye-bye. Okay. Stay safe. Bye. Sue, my God, I so learned glad. something. You're almost, you're, you're, you're almost there. We'll get you there. Oh. You know, Sue, I got through it. I learned something, and I didn't insult anyone except for half of we'll our see. viewers. We'll and um, we'll I know. It's the be Well, uh, the only one I've insulted is you. And can I just say, it's always a pleasure. <laughs> Sue, you give me gravitas, and you make me laugh. Thank you. I don't know what. To do. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, I'll, well, you know, we're doing this. We're trying to have you on every couple of weeks, but uh, I appreciate it. People can watch Sue on NECN, New England Cable News. She is a political commentator, contributor, and a fill in. God knows you're on NWGBH Public Radio. I'm everywhere. I'm everywhere. I know. Again, uh, like me. It's fine. Uh, right. Thank you for being on. I'll thank touch base with you, like, you later you like. in the week. Okay. Bye, bye honey. Um,
my next guest, because, you know, I wanted the boy. Oh, my God. Look at my background has fallen. Um, I wanted these boys all to myself because I've never met a couple I didn't like. And that's true. Um, everybody has been talking about only fan pages and how during the pandemic, people are looking to online entertainment. Um and I think that being part of a really hot couple gives you a little bit of an advantage. And nobody is hotter than our next guests. Um, you know them as Rick and Griff on OnlyFans. Oh, God, there's a nickname. I've already forgot. What is it? A Griff, Rick, a Rickasaurus? I don't know. God, I don't know these things. Anyway, please welcome Rick and Griff. Hey, guys. Hey. Hi there. Hold on, I'll give you I'll give you the bigger screen. I just have to fix my screen. Oh. What is the what is the nickname? What is it? I'm the Griffopotamus. Griffopot there, I got you as a Griffosaurus. Whatever. <laughs> All you. right. Um, you know, uh, I just want to show you I, I think I've got some pictures here. Hold on. Okay, oh, so God. um Okay, but I, you know, I picked oh, tasteful look at the pictures. Oh, wow. I, yeah, I know. My God, and there's lots, lot, lots more hair going on. Yeah. Um, but, but, um, I, I, you know, I picked the ones that I'm like, you know, I've got those same pump underwear. It doesn't look quite the same on me. <laughs> um, and of course, you know, just out as people are propped up and yeah. presenting forward. Um, yeah. But I, I, you know, I really want to make something very clear to people is that you didn't just jump on this bandwagon during the pandemic and say, oh, we, here's an opportunity. You've been doing this for a while. Yeah, since it started. We were so, some of the first people when it first came out. Yeah, I, I, you've been with OnlyFans, was it 2018 that you started? Uh, late 2017, actually. Okay, and how did you get into it? Actually, a friend of ours uh, who knew we had been talking about like developing our own website uh, for paid content said, well, you should check out this new uh, platform that came out because it could save you a lot of work. Uh, they take a percentage, but then they do all of the, you know, the um, technical uh, behind the scenes and all that stuff, which then we wouldn't have to do ourselves. And so it seemed, you know, like a good idea. And we checked it out and it was a great platform and it had everything we needed and we just thought why don't we give it a try and see how it goes and it ended up going pretty good yeah. <laughs> um you know you're not you're not what oh geez hold on now i've lost all of us where do i get you both back hold on uh you know these technical there you go okay um and you've really talked about the difference between being exploitive and being provocative and what terms do you first off I don't consider you porn stars, but I guess in a way you are. I mean, I, I guess if by by default that would be there. There is that is available there, yeah. Um, <laughs> but, but we both come from a performing background. I was a professional dancer and acrobat for several years, and worked for Cirque du Soleil and Disney and on Broadway. Oh wow! And he's a graphic artist and designer, so we both have a, an artistic background. And a, like on our social media, we started off very much more, I would say, like erotic artists where uh, we would try to be creative with nudity in a way and try to make it more fun or more more artistic or creative than just putting our butts on the internet. Blatant. So, yeah. Not that that's, there's anything <laughs> wrong with that. Not that we don't do that too, we can do, but we like, we like to put a little bit of our, you know, performance flair into it as well. Yeah, and what I like when I was looking at some of your footage, which you guys gave me access, which I appreciated. Um, what I really well, we liked was that, <laughs> is that you, you uh, well, you aim to please, and I appreciate that, um, is that you really want to go beyond just the sexual act. Things are lit, things are, are shot in a very different way than most things. I would really call it erotica more than anything else. Yeah, exactly. That's is that exactly fair? Exactly. Well, which is funny that you said that particular <laughs> term because Madonna's uh, early Madonna, especially like the Blonde Ambition period and erotica, was part mm -hmm. of my formative growing up years. And oh, as, really? a, as a kid in rural Nebraska, really gave me something to help me feel like I wasn't wrong for having the the feelings I had or wanting to do the sort of things that I wanted to do that maybe the people in my town or family would have not been okay with. And so yeah. 
it really gave me growing up this sense of fuck you, I'm okay the way I am and I don't have to answer. <laughs> <laughs> so and especially her erotic album when her erotica book came out i i stole it from a walden's i was like 13. <laughs> i walked into a walden's book and shoved the metal hard metal uh foil oh yeah it was the steel thing pants. right yeah. yeah i shoved it down the front of my pants big baggy sweatshirt and stole madonna's erotica that book. was a big book I well, you know, I with it, but you know well i was really skinny back then so there was a lot of room uh <laughs> <laughs> and I took it well, home. And I wasn't looking at it like most boys that age would be looking at it. I was fascinated by the fact that this this woman in a in you know we'll just say it, in a man's world who uh, was just doing exactly what society told women they shouldn't be doing, and she just didn't hold back and she didn't apologize and she owned it. And I think that's where the power of that comes from is like when you own it, nobody can control you. Right. Right. When you when you are upfront about everything you like and do and want and and own it, you you own your world and yeah, nobody no, else. You does. take the power away from them. Exactly. exactly. And I came to that same um, conclusion a little bit later in life. I came from a very traditional family. But where were you based? Where did you I come was from? Out of uh, Simpsonville, South Carolina. They had a oh god spotlight, and it doesn't work. So it's. Uh, I came to this realization the same, kind of like the same way that Rick did, but I was older. I was in, into my twenties, and mm-hmm. still the liberation from it, the the taking your power, owning owning it, it was really what set me off into this into this lane as well. Was it was it part of the coming out process, or was it its own separate mm-hmm. entity? You know, this owning the sexuality and the almost exhibitionism aspect of it. I, well, I would say for both of us, but I'll speak for myself. Mm -hmm. uh, It it was not part of my coming out process. I don't even really feel like I had a coming out process. I always was very much just who I was. And Uh um, I I never really had to come out. I think everybody figured it out pretty early. (laughs) (laughs) and I, I always was a strangely independent and determined kid. And I, I, and I did usually, when I set my mind to something, I wanted to do something, I did it. And I didn't ask permission and I didn't right. expect his approval. I did what I wanted to do. And I found that doing that throughout my life has usually led me to my biggest successes. Wow. And what about you, Griff? So my coming out story, I, I like I said, the Madonna aspect came into it in late in my twenties. I came out when I was eighteen, and I had um, the queerest folk was kind of a big catalyst for my coming out. So watching that show, seeing gay men doing what gay men do, like gay things, gay things, <laughs> doing some like seeing that there are like family clusters that are of actual family but friends as well that it helped with it being okay and so that was Mm -hmm. for me the the big kind of push of confidence to to finally accept myself and then have the courage to come out to my family so how did you two meet (laughs) you want to take that one oh sure go uh (laughs) it it feels better anyway (laughs) all right I had been living and working uh, for several years in Hong Kong, and then I retired from my stage career and decided to open my own personal training company. And I moved to Atlanta uh, to do that. And I was looking, I built up a clientele, and then I was looking around for gyms where I could take my clients to train. Uh, and I heard through my ex-boyfriend, who was my boyfriend at the time, that he had been on set, he was a movie actor, and he was on set with somebody and had been talking and found out that this guy owned a gym and was looking for trainers with a clientele to mm-hmm. come and train in this gym and ended up being him. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I, I, I messaged him and he said, come in and check it out. And I walked in and said, I'm here to see Griff King. And they pointed me to the training room and there he was shirtless doing a uh, jump rope. And uh, <laughs> a lot more hair back then though, as well. He did have some hair back then. <laughs> Um, and then started training my clients there. And my ex-boyfriend that introduced us ended up breaking up with me and leaving. 
And then oh, he left you. I know, right? Can you believe it? It's shocking. I can't. Because <laughs> I was all ready for your your fooling around in the workout room and the boyfriend finds out. But so <laughs> you hadn't had feeling. I mean, I assume you realized he was retractive, but you weren't the one that was doing the leaving. No. Wow. Nope. Okay. Go ahead. Continue. And it wasn't for any reason to do with us that he left. <laughs> right. Okay. But then a couple months later, I remember, uh, can't, well, I can't actually remember who it was. Somebody at the gym said I should ask Rip out on a date because they thought he liked me. And I said, really? He has, I haven't gotten that vibe, but I guess I could and asked him out on a date. And we went out on a date. And here we are eight years later, married. And yeah. So, Griff, where, uh, from your aspect, were uh -huh. you, like, waiting for him to become single, or did it just hit you when he was available? No, not at all. In in the beginning, I feel like I was kind of a jerk to him because I was running this, <laughs> he was bringing his clients in. So I kind of felt, uh, even though he wasn't an employee, I kind of felt like I was uh, kind of in a supervisor role. But uh, sure. there was no That's denying, what he thought. <laughs> but there was no denying that... I started to develop feelings uh, in attraction. And so I had a conversation with this person that ended up, you know, saying, hey, I think you should ask Griff out on a date. I think he likes you just, but it was in passing. It wasn't like I was, oh my gosh, he's, I, I need to be with him kind of a thing. It's like, yeah, I think he's really, really attractive. And yeah, I go on a date with him. And so you were single at the time? I was, yes. Okay, well, we just making were, sure. Yeah. Yes. Well, at that point, okay. But when yeah. you first met, did you both have boyfriends? I did. He well, I was talking with somebody at the time who also well had talking, him, but yeah, but oh well, yeah, he was talking to somebody also named Griff. Also I'll named Griff. Computer. Go figure. No, come yeah. on, really? Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right. Yeah. Was that was that the name on his birth certificate, or was that just a made up name? No, that was it. That's his actual. Oh name. my god. How, what are the chances to find two Griffs? I, not like me. <laughs> okay, so anyway, so you, so he becomes single. You, at, who asked who out? He did. He asked me out on a date, the first date. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, and was it Sparks and, and from the first date? Did you think? <laughs> oh no, that's okay, the story. Go ahead. go ahead. Are you? So we're in the middle of our first date, and we're. Where are you? Uh, we were at Midtown Kitchen in one Atlanta, Midtown kitchen, one yeah. Midtown Kitchen, and we were having a great dinner, and actually Very the fancy. conversation was going well, and I thought the date was going great, and then he gets a text message from his boss and got fired halfway through our date. Yeah, the actual, like, <laughs> wow. financial owner of the place, and he was like, yeah, we don't need your services anymore. Pack oh, my God. So that made the rest of the date a little awkward. Very. I would think, um, yeah. And, and then... Um, our second date, because he was living in the mother-in-law suite of his boss's house, our second date was me taking my truck to help him move his stuff out. So, yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. You know, you're a – you know, can I tell you just – this has nothing to do with your story. When I moved to L.A., there was somebody who I was texting with online before I moved there. This is 20 years ago. And every time I was in L.A. visiting, he never had time to meet me. But when I moved there, he suddenly was free to meet me for pizza and asked if I'd help him move the next day. <laughs> and I thought to myself, oh, yeah, that's why you have time. We are still friends, but it is in the back of my mind. That's a little advantage. Mm -hmm, but yeah. at that, from that second day, did you, would it smooth sailing at that point? Oh, no. I, it, <laughs> <laughs> I often say that we, I know it was meant to be because, um, and not to spill too much tea, but he was unemployed, yeah. <laughs> homeless. And a bit of a drunk. <laughs> so you were a catch. I think so. <laughs> uh, but, but clearly, when did you have sex first? Oh, oh goodness. Um, like maybe three weeks after our first date? Yeah. Look at that old-fashioned boy. I know, right? <laughs> like, Who I initiated, know. initiated that? Huh? Oh, goodness. Mm. That's a good question. I mean, I remember, where, I remember where it happened. Yeah, I remember where it happened, but I think it just kind of happened, you know? Yeah. Like, it was... It I don't was... even think... Wait, no. I I lived... At that time, I lived a little bit outside of the Atlanta perimeter. 
and I think he was driving home to South Carolina to see his parents, mm -hmm. and I well, was on the he's way. homeless. Right. Hey, where am I going to go? <laughs> so um, I, think he, I think he stopped on the way to South Carolina to just like say hi or have lunch or something. And then next. So you were like a booty call. I, 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 sort of. Yeah. He wanted lunch. I gave him dessert. That's just kind of a thing. All right. No, I, these are, so beforehand, did you both think it was going at least in that direction? Or were you just no, waiting? It was, was, yeah. we, were, we were talking every day. I mean, we were dating. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. we had we were texting all the time, calling all the time. We would hang out, and so like I felt confident that this was something that to invest time in and you know my feelings. And you you're both at that point how old? Oh my, let's see, it was eight years ago. So let me do some quick math here. I was thirty six. Get out my calculator, okay? I was thirty six, and he would have been twenty seven. Yeah, somewhere around there. So you're both at a point where you really do have at least some life experience. Mm -hmm. You're not going into this blind. You're thinking to yourself, and if it doesn't work out, you do still have professional circles. Yeah. Did yeah. you think to yourself from the beginning that this is good personally and professionally? When does that come oh. in? Um, gosh, professionally, I don't think we really thought that there could be any sort of like branding or uh business based around us being a couple probably like four years into our relationship mm -hmm. wow so it was a progression yes it was and would you say now it is your main profession that it is the bulk of your your professional life Absolutely. Oh, well, I mean, it definitely brings in the most income. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. All right. Let's talk about income. Okay, good. Thank you for bringing that up. So now lots of numbers are being brought up. There's an HBO documentary. There was something uh -huh. on Vice. I've mm -hmm. been seeing a lot about OnlyFans. I have friends that have OnlyFan pages. Clearly, they're either lying to me or they're not as successful as you. I'm assuming it's the latter. And so my question is, is that... It, has the pandemic made it jump exponentially or were you successful even before that? We were successful prior. Uh, okay. there, there, was a, there was a bump in uh, subscriptions during the pandemic, but not anything that is, it was still in the same average. Like if we were to average out our year, it was the same as the year before. Well, like, okay. Well, close enough to say that it wasn't the pandemic that made us successful. We were already doing very well before that. Okay. Yeah. And again, numbers are floating around and I don't think you should have to give people like the IRS could be watching, but well, I mean, well, numbers I mean, people, of people can do easy math. They yeah. can see how many yeah. subscribers we have and take it times 10. <laughs> right. And so, I mean, we keep hearing numbers like hundreds of thousands a month, we, you know, Obviously, if you're doing that, that's fabulous. And obviously, the government is getting paid because everything is just uh, like... Boy, do they I, ever. I'll tell you that. Yes, yeah. they I was just on the yeah. phone with them earlier. For the, for the record. record. For yeah. The record. Well, again, because what people don't understand is when you do something online and it's going through a merchant account, everything is reported. Every so I understand that. And, you know, I think people think, oh, they're getting so rich. I mean, we're talking about, depending on your bracket, you know, between a third and a half is taken right off the top. You're not ever seeing that in most no. cases. No. Well, we, our business is through, a, we, we're an S Corp. And so we pay ourselves a paycheck and that's where okay. we're taken out there, which is, is a great, it's a great, it's great for us. For our business. Because you don't ever see it. You don't even have to think about that no. other money. No. Yeah, which is great. Um, it makes it easier. And, you know, um, do you, because I didn't look at all the videos, you know, I mean, I have a little carpal tunnel. Well, I am offended. This interview is over. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, you know, I had Gabby to look at. Um, <laughs> but but do you... I, I saw that you photograph with other models. Have you done yeah. videos with other models? Yeah. Uh -huh. How now? I look, I, and and people who watch the show regularly know this. I have dated escorts. I've dated porn stars. I've been God knows around. And what's very interesting is, I would think in in regular life I can be a very jealous person. I had 
absolutely no jealousy when it had to do with business. Sure. That I had a boyfriend who was an escort and I would talk to him and say, how many times did you work today? What was good? What happened? Blah, blah, blah. But if right. we went out to a bar and somebody approached him, wanted to buy him a drink, I would turn into a lunatic. So they, because that's private time, that's us. Mm -hmm. So I get it. Do the people that you've worked with, is it always that same way that there is the professional and it doesn't cross over? Yes. Sorry, there's a bit of a lag in the video. Um, That's okay. Uh, yeah, we, like it's 100% uh, when it's business we're working and not just between us, you know, we, we were a very, we had a very good communication system in place long before we ever started doing this. So th that wasn't even any obstacle to get over for us. But um, we also, you know, not to get too personal, but we also Please. have a boyfriend. <laughs> you, excuse me, what did you say? We also have a boyfriend. And, okay, so there is a third party. Yes, and he does, he's not on our social media or he, on our OnlyFans. It's a it's completely personal relationship. And he's the same way. He knows that he knows everybody that we're working with. He knows what our schedule is. And that's work. And then when it's private time, it's private time. Yeah. And, and presumably yeah. when he came into this, you already had the business up oh, yeah. and running. Oh, yeah. So he, he knew what he was getting it. into. Yeah. yeah, he knew what he was getting into. And there's, um, and there's never, we've been now seeing him for nearly eight months and there's never been a single problem or fight or, yeah, it's been great. So we just have you just been, like, yeah, communicate is key. Had there been a time prior to him that you had a third party or play, or it may not have been serious, but even played with the third party personally? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The thing so that you guys are, are people who are both on the same page. Like we talked about with Gabby, the more honest you are and the more open you are with your feelings, the less 100%. chance there is of getting hurt. Yeah, and that's 100%. the thing that we fight about the least <laughs> is, is sex, sex <laughs> and our sex life. Like, like, like that's never even close to being something that we fight about in our life. Really? Just because we talk and we communicate, we are 100% open with each other. We communicate our feelings 100%. And that's, it's so key. It's key. Clutch. Now, the who's going to clean the litter box in the morning? Every day we fight about it. Every day. <laughs> <laughs> we'll bring that up on well, air. <laughs> I say the third party can do that because he's got to earn his you know, well, I think you're right. I'll let you tell him that. <laughs> Please, by all means. Um, what what happens when, you know, when you have co-stars, and I'm using that term like they're on Gilligan's Island or something, but let's say, sure. um, is awesome. the co-star, you know, do you both have to be into the co-star or even if you're not into it, you're able to say, well, we're just working, so who cares? I think it's important to also make sure everybody understands we don't cast these things like we're not a porn studio. These are people we know or oh, or they are company. okay. Yeah, like, we, like it's people that we 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 don't just bring people in that are strangers. Like they're, they're an actor and you right. know with all the play. These are people that we know that we we trust and that we've we have dialogue with. Yeah, and we've so, communicated with, and they know what's up. A lot of people will like, you know, be like, oh, you should work with so-and-so. I'm like, well, we don't know so-and-so. So, I mean, if <laughs> so, it, yeah, it, it, we try to keep everything pretty much grounded in our real life and not, I mean, even though it is a fantasy, but, you know, it, it, we're, we're not just casting people off the street. That's part of our thing, our shtick, is that it's a heightened reality of our actual life. And so it's, it's, it's just kind of what we do is what we should. Which is also what makes OnlyFans successful. You know, people. Right. Oh, absolutely. I think they want the voyeurism of looking at what they believe is reality, even though, yeah. like any reality show has taught us, reality is heightened when cameras mm -hmm. are on. Yeah. And I think one thing that makes us so successful is that, and I'll make this quick, is that we started out in like the YouTube universe. And so we're doing lip syncs to Disney songs, and it's very wholesome <laughs> stuff. Oh, and I I'm wish sure I had those clips. Met, oh, boy, you uh, could go to the YouTube Rick and the Griffopotamus take on. Well, I saw, yeah, yeah no, I saw some of them. Uh, yeah. But and then we went into in, the Instagram world, and that was a little bit edgy, a little bit more sexy and artistic stuff. We kind of kept the Facebook with family and kept it P, like PG. But Instagram was a little bit edgier. And then when our friend was like, hey. Let's call it what it is, thirstier. Yeah. Thirstier. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. So, right. Yeah. Well, and then our friend kind of introduced us to this new 
OnlyFans thing. And so people can get to see the wholesome part of our lives. They get to see the edgier part. And if they want to, mm -hmm. they can see the more intimate parts of our life. So they get this whole image of who we are, our heightened reality. And if they want to see us singing the soundtrack to Wicked, they can go to YouTube. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, you know, speaking of that, on the different platforms, I did notice that you use Instagram or Twitter to feed people, to feed mm -hmm. people, so to speak, right. yeah. to the OnlyFans page. Yeah. Um, and well, there is a here. good... Right. And and so there's a good amount of nudity and suggestion material on those other platforms. Have you run into problems with that? Problems in what way? With nudity. With and, censorship uh, or right in oh, people oh, yeah. taking things down. Our main, Instagram account, images. Yeah, mm -hmm. our main Instagram account is currently disabled for about the twelfth time. <laughs> really? With, um, I think we currently have about four hundred thousand sub uh, fans or followers on Instagram on that account and it's uh -huh. been shut now for about a month. It's wow. usually come back after, you know, sometimes it's taken a couple weeks, sometimes it's taken a couple months, but you never know if it's going to come back or not. But luckily, when we started to see where things were going with Instagram and how bad the censorship was getting, especially toward gay men sure. and gay male imagery, we mm -hmm. started funneling people into backup accounts. So we have our two backup accounts, which still have quite a few followers, and then also to Twitter where the censorship doesn't seem to be as bad yet. No, I saw more nudity on that that seemed to be fine. Nobody had a problem with it. Yeah. Um, does is does that, when that happens with the other accounts, does your OnlyFans page, does your finances take a hit as well? Or do your subscribers, they're pretty stable? Yeah, they're pretty stable. Our subscription numbers don't really fluctuate all that much. Wow. And I, if this had been two years ago, I would have probably had a panic attack when our Instagram got shut down. But now we have a stable subscriber subscriber base. And also, you can, you still have access to all of your expired subscribers who you can... Right, that you can then email. And, yes. Mm -hmm. um, so that has helped a lot. So there has not been even a dent since our uh, Instagram yeah. got shut down. So it doesn't, it, it's honestly, it's the least of my worries. You know, I, uh, I when I, w when I lived in Boston over 20 years ago and did shows, there was a, there was a uh, married couple. Well, they weren't married obviously at the time, but a gay couple that performed live that was digital orgasm and they were behind a scrim and they would basically do a lot of sexual, um, I, you know, imagery more than acts behind mm -hmm. the scrim with a backlight and do live shows. Have mm -hmm. you guys considered performing live when that is an opportunity? What will that look like? I don't think, I don't really think that that's our vibe. Not that we yeah. wouldn't. We, we're just, we, we're, we like to create our content and I don't, I don't know. I just don't think. And control it. In control, yeah. yes. And we we have our brand standards that we put on it as well. You were talking earlier with Gabby how important you know the branding was. Well, with Absolutely. us, you know, it, it helps define us from the other people that are doing OnlyFans as well, especially when it's become as saturated as it has been as of recent times. So it's kind of it kind of gives us, I think, I think a little bit of an edge. You know, speaking of saturation, I, I I know when I worked in clubs, there were two ways people worked. One way, if you did shows, you could only work in one club because they used you as sort of a branding technique. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I liked working in various clubs because I always felt that it ha it helped the whole community, that people follow you from club to club, so the clubs mm -hmm. end up winning. Mm -hmm. Has the saturation of OnlyFans helped or hurt you? Because there's so many more people going there, you could be discovered by more people. On the other hand that's also more competition i don't really feel a competition toward any other only fans creators because if people are attracted to us or want to see us they're going to subscribe to us mm -hmm. uh -huh. if, they, if they like joe schmo across the street better they're going to subscribe to him it doesn't really there's not really any weight like or reason to feel there's a competition there our fan base is our fan base and they're going to be our fan base and we grow our fan base organically ourselves we don't do it by competing with other people, um, you know, people, people come to follow us. 
Mm-hmm. And, and that's not going to change. Like, did, like they can find somebody else that they also like to follow. That doesn't mean that they're not going to unfollow us just because they find somebody else that they also like. Right. And, and I feel as one as person's as, success doesn't hinder anybody else's success. And as long as we continue to put forth the kind of product that is, you know, what like what we've been doing, I feel people will will stay. And and so the competition with others, I, we're in competition with ourselves. With ourselves <laughs> to keep. Yeah giving what we've been yeah giving. and and so but you are big to our on our own content yes sure no i get that and and it seems to me that your biggest competition is really with your own archived content that you have to keep putting mm-hmm. out new content to keep the fans satisfied i presume yeah, so how much how often do you present new content well we post every day do you but okay yeah, but we have now such a vast amount of past material mm-hmm. that we don't have to create it nearly as often as we used to because okay. we can go way back and pull something if, if you know so we we can use what we've already created in the past to help give us a little bit more time off these days. <laughs> and also again for new people it's going to be new to them. Exactly. Correct. Yes. Exactly. Um but it's got to be exhausting. It can because be. it is a job. I mean, I think that people don't recognize that when people are posting bloggers, I give them such credit when they post like 10 things a day. That mm-hmm. is a job. And you yeah. have to really treat it like a job. It's more than just what like people think or it's just like sex or whatever. But no, like I, I'm in the office yeah. behind you <laughs> oh. for eight hours a day <laughs> editing. And I go in, I've, I've made our... Like, the brands, the graphics, like it, it's, it's a lot. It, it's a full-time job. And I wake up and I, you know, answer messages and that takes. Yeah. Long. That again, keeping yeah. those fans and subscribers, if they're having technical issues, if they just mm-hmm. want to ask a question, mm-hmm. if you don't interact with them, you will lose them. So I, <laughs> uh, you know, is it, is it a relationship Do you have, you, developed relationships with fans that you now consider um, either friends or beyond just a fan? Yeah, there's a couple people that we met through our OnlyFans who then, you know, they were in town and they asked if they could like meet us for dinner or t- and we went and like got to know and became friends with like probably maybe two or three people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, this because you've said that you would only interact with people on camera that you are friends with. Mm-hmm. What if a, I'm sure you have fans asking you if they could have sex with you, if they could hire you, whatever. I presume since you've only met a couple of them, that means that you have not done that. No, correct. And lot, so, again, you're very time. clear <laughs> what the what the limits are of what you do. You are performers. You are presenters. You're not escorts. You're not yeah. hookers. You're not go-go dancers. You have a not that anything wrong with that. I've been No, called, right, no. <laughs> I've been called all of those before. Yeah, okay. But no, no. We, <laughs> yeah, well, as I said, I've slept with them all, so it's fine. Yeah. No, uh, we, we, don't, uh, we don't see fans or get paid to have sex with fans. That's just not part of what we do. Like, we... We create content and people can enjoy that all they want, but that's where it ends. Yes. Have I have the porn companies approached you oh, about yes. making films for them? Yeah. Yes. And again, I do I, I politely decline because what we have created is not only successful financially, but it also gives us complete control over our content and our brand. And so there would there it just wouldn't make any sense professionally to put something out there that everybody else has control over that then we also don't have control when it's all over the internet. Mm-hmm. Um, and competes with yourself. It competes with ourselves. Like, right. like one of the other reasons I feel we've been as successful as we have been on OnlyFans is because we weren't in porn prior to it. And so, oh, right, sure, people, people can't just go on the internet and find tons of us having sex, right? And we also we have a DMCA lawyer that every day goes through the internet and takes down anything that's leaked from our OnlyFans page for us. Oh, make- does that, ha- I hadn't even thought that. Does that happen? Do people oh, yeah, try yeah. to oh, repurpose yeah. your content? We have great fans though, because the minute they find something online, they'll send us the link and then we send the link to our lawyer and it's down within 24 hours. It's It's been great. And that's because people can't just easily find a bunch of our stuff online. Then they need to subscribe if they do want to see it. 
So what is the best part of this? Is it the is the best part like anybody else who has a business of their own that you are working for yourself and you've created this Absolutely. empire? One hundred percent. Being able to be our own boss and we get to work at home together every day. And, you know, there are parts of that that are scary. You know, when you're completely on your own and you don't have a company giving you medical insurance or a 401k yeah. and you have to make sure you succeed on your own. That can be a little terrifying at first, but then, you know, about three years into this, I realized, wow, we're like really doing this. And we've been smart with our money and our investments and we just bought a new home. Um, and I, it, it's wonderful. It's, 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 there's a lot of freedom in that, that a lot of, that we didn't have prior. So yeah. let's just put it that way. I so what is the, oh, go ahead. I didn't have any of, of the freedoms and I, I kind of, Felt a little bit stifled a bit. This has allowed really? me to really expand my creativity, not just and creativity with sex, <laughs> creativity with my graphics and with creating this brand, maintaining this brand, building this brand. So it's mm -hmm. it's it's very fulfilling, no pun intended, for you know, for me personally. And obviously there's a shelf life. I mean, we live in a, an ageist society, which is youth oriented. Now, obviously your subscribers are loyal, but they are at some point going to go elsewhere. What are your aspirations? What do you want to do next? Well, we have a lot of irons in the fire. We have our uh -huh. merchandise line now, which has been super successful, more successful than I thought it would be right off the bat. And that's great. And we are expanding that currently. And then we also have some other ideas that we're working with with other OnlyFans models uh, for other pages that um, won't necessarily just have to focus on us, but will showcase up and coming or like our. Yeah, could you manage other people? Could you become, you know, um, content providers for others? I, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that we would want to manage them, but we would provide a space where we could showcase people. And then they would make a cut of the profit off of what they oh, would make okay. on the page sort of thing. Yeah. Um, so then even as we get older, we can still have that to have. Well, you've got a brand like a porn yeah. company has a brand. And so and you'd have to obviously be responsible for the quality that people have yes. come to expect from you. Mm -hmm. And of course, I think we have so much content in like the <laughs> vault that we could. We, like 80 years old, and I joke about this, we could be 80 years old and be like, yeah, let's put that one from 2018. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, we, felt, okay. we, had, we had five years worth of content just ready to go back and start at the beginning. <laughs> well, can I just say, I, I I will share a story with Bob E of Bob East, who used to run Men of Odyssey, which was a defunct porn company. He was working with Jeff Stryker a mm -hmm. good 25 or 30 years ago in his idea, he's like, shoot a ton of content that nobody will ever see. And then when you disappear, you start leaking out new content and Jeff yeah. didn't do it. And I thought that was such a brilliant idea. But we film content very far in advance. We just released, Jeez, good. Uh, we just released something that we filmed before the pandemic hit. And we only just released it this last couple wow. of weeks. So we film we film far in advance, and we have a lot of stuff that hasn't been released. So. But that also means you have to maintain a look that looks similar to that content. That's going to be tough. I mean, I came from a stage career, and so I was used to. I played Tarzan for Disney for nearly eight years, oh, so, I, so you I know, know. What it means to have to keep the same look for a long period of time. Yes. Like, I mean, so, like, you can't shave if you want to. I mean, we could, but I mean, we probably. <laughs> Uh, I don't. We wouldn't want to anyway. Let's just put it that way. I look like Mr. Potato Head. God I rest mean, his you, canceled you, soul. That picture. <laughs> I mean, you'll you could tell why we we don't shave anymore. <laughs> right, but, but like uh, both of you cats, could. What are they called? Those hairless cats, sphinxes. Yeah, yeah, that's what we look oh, like. Yeah. Yeah. But I think that that's, again, you really have locked into something and there are pros and cons. And I think people have to recognize that you don't really have freedom within the brand when it's successful. No, people ex have an expectation. And especially if you want to stay recognizable as your brand, you have to have a brand standard that you stick to. Especially if it works. 
Yeah. Especially if it's working, don't change. <laughs> I tried to change a few things a while back with how we ran things and had the worst month of revenue we ever had. I'm like, I never do that again. <laughs> I, you know, I, I will tell you anytime people complain about certain things. And I remember when I started my website, people say, oh, I wish you'd do that. And you do it. And the complaints that people have to learn where a new button is or whatever, it is mm -hmm. so not worth it. Yeah. Yeah. So stick with what's working for you. I yeah. want to just uh, well, show you. <laughs> I'm going to show people this is the OnlyFans page, uh, OnlyFans.com, Rick and Griff. Um, and is that that's the main place people should go, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And again, follow them on social media. You guys are so interesting. We have so, uh, we run so long, but uh, I just want to thank you and we'll definitely thank have you. you back. Thank you. Absolutely. All right. Thanks for coming with us. Uh, Rick and Griff, uh, definitely yeah. check them out. And again, let me just put up the website one more time. Only fans, Rick and Griff. Right uh, we will see you soon. Take care. Take Bye. care. Bye. Uh, thank you, everybody, for watching Billy Masters Live. Next Thursday, Disco Diva Martha Wash is going to be here and some surprise guests. So you won't want to miss that. And um, oh, my God. The next, we have so many great guests coming up. So anyway, yeah, be sure to you know, check me out. Make sure that you keep checking out BillyMasters.com. The best gossip that's out there. New column is out every Monday. And, of course, Bay Windows in Boston, L.A. We're around the country. Uh, take care. Um, and where is my little outro? I need my outro. God, it's been such a day. Anyway, because it's 70 degrees out. I want to get out and take a walk. Anyway, thank you for watching Billy Masters Live. And remember, if we're here, we're live. See you next week, guys. Bye-bye.